many works, including Robert Emmett and the Rising of 1803, the Rebellion in Wicklow, 1798, special category, the IRA in English prisons. He is co-editor of the highly successful 16 Lives series and author of that series, Patrick Pierce Biography. He is also editor of The Impact of the 1916 Rising Among the Nations. He was first awarded the Fulbright Scholar in Residence Award in 2017 and taught Irish history at the University of Montana. He was previously visiting chair of Irish history at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. Dr. O'Donnell is an unrivaled authority on Irish revolutionary history. Please join me in welcoming him to speak about Wolf Tone and the United Irishmen. Well, many thanks for that um, kind invitation. Um, I'm very honoured to be here. I've never been asked to speak at Baltistown before. I did manage to kill Michael and cross Barry, and I thought I was doing well, but now I'm at the grave of Wolf Tone himself, the farther of it all. So thank you indeed for this. I was asked to basically give you, I suppose to an audience that doesn't really require it, a brief overview of the life, political career, contribution and legacy of Theobald Wolf Tone. That is something that is, is worthy of uh, a, a much fuller, um, investigative, analytical approach. So this will take the form of a thumbnail sketch of his greatest hits and uh, why tone must be remembered and why tone is still important. I suppose the basic biography is he was born in June 1763 in Dublin City. And if you read certain accounts of him and how he's characterized, they often stress the fact that he was often, um, uh, as you say, embarrassed in funds. And that is certainly a situation, but he was in the, at no point in his life was Tone ever conventionally poor. It's put it that way. Something's going on here. Can you forget that? Let's do that. Thanks. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Thanks very much. So the situation with Tone is, yes, by the standards of the privileged upper middle classes, and the, the lesser gentry, as they call themselves, and the aristocracy, as they call themselves, because I can't even pronounce, I'm so unused to saying such words, <laughs> that uh, he wasn't poor. Uh, he would have been involved in, um, a family was involved in business, coach baking in Dublin. His father was a coach maker in Stafford Street. He had relatives who were uh, landlords in this part of the country. Mm -hmm. he, he'd re he had relatives who um, were connected to the law and were very much high in the councils of the self-described Anglo-Irish Protestant descendancy. He was born into a very previous situation in which he was very self-conscious. In the 1760s, 1770s, about 3% of the Irish population completely determined the entirety of economics and politics in Ireland. You had to be not only born into the Church of Ireland, the Anglican faith in this, this country, a, a very significant uh, uh, faith with, within those of Ireland, but you had to be landed and the combination of land and established religion was critical. And we must bear in mind that non-conformist Protestants, who, who in many counties represented quite a sizable body of our people, were discriminated against officially under penal type legislation and were not emancipated until 1828 in Britain and Ireland. Uh, the Catholic population, which was more than 80% of the whole in this country, was even more severely penalised until 1829 when basic efforts were made towards bringing them up to legal parity with their uh, persons of other Christian religions. Now, even then, of course, we're not talking about a democratic dispensation. We're talking about a situation when Ireland was bound into an empire against its will, when uh, until 1801 there was a colonial talking shop in, Dublin, in Dublin's, uh, Dublin City at College Green, our College Green, with the real brains of the operation being Dublin Castle, where basically speaking British administrators in Ireland decided what was best for all of us. Uh, the, the idea of uh, democracy was alien, it was, it was known in Tone's lifetime as the French disease and basically the concept of one man one vote was out of the question and you would have been regarded as a lunatic for suggesting that women might be able to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, there were those within the United Irishmen uh, who were suggesting that such things would have to be considered in due course, not least the uh, Mary Wollstonecraft and others who were connected with the Irish radical tradition, but uh, they would have been considered lunatic fringe. Uh, the idea of one man one vote was alien. I mean, it would be harder to grasp than the idea of Bolshevism in 1917 in, in most uh, capitalist economies. So Tone was not well off 
uh, by the standards of his uh, co-religionists, but he was still comfortable throughout his life. Uh, he went to Trinity College Dublin in 1781, which remained, of course, uh, a bastion of the Protestant Assemblies in Ireland and, of course, of the Protestant Reformation in Ireland, hence the obnoxious test oath that graduates had to swear before taking their degree. It's one of the main, main reasons why, even after Catholics were permitted to go to Trinity College Dublin, which is late in the day and during Tom's lifetime, in many cases they refused to do so. Or, uh, like some very interesting scholars like John O'Mahony, would go attend Trinity but not take their final degree uh, as a point to protest against the obnoxious test oath. In 1784, he did something very naughty indeed. He eloped with his girlfriend, uh, Matilda Witherington, uh, who um, was very young for the time. She was only 16 years old, and these days I think that's technically illegal. It is in most parts of the world anyway. But nonetheless, it was a very good and lasting and proper marriage, which is uh, which unusual when you think about it. But this, of course, disrupted his studies, and he didn't take his BA until 1786. Now, in those few years, you have the British rise to empire coming out of the Seven Years' War, 1756 to 63, the year which Tone was born. You had the American War, the seismic shock of the American War in the 1770s, where 13 uh, North American colonies broke away from London. Uh, the biggest single fighting element that wasn't born in the United States was Irish. Uh, Washington's army was full of the Irish, and in due course, Tone emulated a wish to become Ireland's Washington. And he very nearly succeeded. Uh, he was a no lesser stature than the great George Washington. Um, by the 1780s, his uh, father had relocated here, Bodenstown, uh, partly due to, um, I suppose, a failure in business in Dublin, but also because of his family connections. Tone wasn't finished with his education. He was a man who did require a career because he wasn't born into large amounts of money. And he went to the Middle Temple to study law in London in 1787, qualifying as a barrister in 1789. Now, in 1789, the French Revolution occurred and all things became possible. Uh, for a popular force to overthrow the strongest monarchy in the Western world, backed by the strongest army in the Western world, was inconceivable, but it occurred. And the fact that France was a Catholic nation, and that France put in position the most democratic form of governance that the Western world had ever seen, was extremely impressive. And there were lessons for Ireland, and people like Tone were keen to, to uh, take account of them. By 1789 1790, Tone was openly identifying himself with what would have been considered a radical tendency that were proto-democratic. Tone himself was very, very tolerant on the issue of religion. Uh, it's fair to say that the late 1870s, 1890s are interesting in that there was a sort of a, a lessening of devotional um, boundaries and delineations. Um, intermarriage between faiths is very common. Um, graveyards were tended to be mixed and not in a, in a, in a nasty sectarianized way. Uh, Tone himself was very liberal and he moved in a circle of people in Dublin of like mind. It would take too long for me to go through them, but these are some of the great minds of, of, of Ireland in the late 1700s. William Drennan, Thomas Addis Emmett, Samuel Nielsen, Thomas Russell. Russell being his lifelong friend, uh, ex-army officer from Cork, who ended up as the librarian of the Linen Hall Library in Belfast. You're looking here at some of the sharpest minds of Dublin and Belfast, and these are the men who in October and November 1791 formed the Society United Irishmen, United Irishmen for short. Now consider this, in his first incarnation, you're looking at a coming together of people of very different backgrounds. You have people like Nielsen and Drennan, uh, Belfast Presbyterians of, of enlightened views. You have liberal Protestants such as Wolf Tone himself and Thomas Russell. Uh, and you also have William James McNevin, who as a Galway, West of Ireland Catholic, was not permitted to attend University in Ireland and got his uh, instruction in places like Prague and the University of Vienna, making him one of the highest qualified doctors Ireland had ever seen on his return. Uh, he, he was extremely important for the development of medicine in New York City and State afterwards. Now, these are people from differing backgrounds, subjected simultaneously to different types of law, depending on what faith they happen to be born into. And that, of course, is pernicious and wrong and immoral and incorrect. Uh, the United Irishman strove to unite Protestant Catholic at the centre. I'll read you very briefly what Tone said. Oh, <coughs> I got it. I'm being blown away by Tone here. <laughs> to subvert the tyranny of our execrable government, to break the connection with England, the never-failing source of all our political evils, and to assert the independence of my country, these were my objects. To unite the whole people of Ireland, to abolish the memory of all past dissensions, and to substitute the common name of Irishman in place of the denominations of Protestant, Catholic and dissenter, these were my means. Now dissenter, of course, is the term by which the Ireland's Presbyterian community preferred to be called at the time, and Tone was very much in keeping with them. The original Society of United Irishmen were Republican in orientation, they want a self-determination for Ireland as an independent republic along the lines of America more so than France. Uh, the French Revolution, many would believe, had been too severe. 
the nationalisation of all church property was going too far. The suppression of traditional religion was too much for most of those who were the early Irish uh, Republicans. But it was, of course, necessary in, in establishing a, a, a secular, uh, independent republic where faith was a matter of private life and not the business of the state, that necessitated a complete cessation of links with the British monarchy. I mean, you, you, you could not have had an independent, self-determined Ireland that was anything other than a republic because the British would not have tolerated it for various reasons. It was they who concentrated the head of their church with the head of their state. It, 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 with, with no protections of civil liberties, with no collated constitution, with no concept of equal rights, and no concept of, of, of equality between people per se. And that's precisely what the United Irishmen wished to address. Now, they started off with a small social elite, fairly well off, middle class and professionals. And they grew quite quickly into a broader group. With the advent of the French War in 1792 and the failure to, to contain uh, French republicanism in Europe, uh, identifying yourself with these ideas went from being radical, a little bit daring, to being arguably seditious. And of course, there were going to be consequences. As, they turn, as the wheel turned against the interests of Irish uh, reformers and, and indeed proto-revolutionaries, Tone was ensnared in, in, um, and correctly un unveiled as being in league with the French. In other words, he was receptive to French offers of foreign military assistance to liberate Ireland from British imperialist oppression. In 1794, he had sufficient clout still left in the Dublin sector to avoid being brought to trial for treason, where he would have been convicted and at least certainly sentenced to death. Whether they executed him or not, we don't know. But instead of that, he was allowed quietly to go into exile in America. Uh, he went to Philadelphia, where several other uh, Irish exiles, uh, emigres, had congregated, a city with an early, its own Society of United Irishmen, incidentally. And there, uh, through his uh, connections, contacted Citizen Ade, the plenipotentiary of the French government in the United States of America. With Ade's assistance, he travelled to Paris as Citizen Smith. I mean, it was a great name for a biography of, of Tone, I suppose. And it was immediately, doors opened, almost immediately, doors opened to the highest levels of the French government. Now, one thing I reflect on about Tone, this is a highly articulate, intelligent man, trained in law with a discipline of focus that, uh, that brings, who, who never had any great uh, enthusiasm for doing so. His primary motive, really, from his early adulthood, was to secure the emancipation of the Irish people as a collective and to do things that were dangerous, difficult, and in many ways formidable. But he addressed this with every might of his being. This is a man who, in his own lifetime, attended sessions of the Irish House of Commons and House of Lords, of the English or British House of Commons and House of Lords, of the American, uh, of the American Congress in Philadelphia, of the French National Assembly in Paris, of the Hague in the Netherlands, which was then ruling the Low Countries. There could possibly have been no other person on earth who personally witnessed all of those forums in session. And in most cases, he was in a position to gain access to those who were exercising the levers of power. His background, his politics, his force of personality, and his sheer ability as a polemicist and a debater opened many doors for us in a way that's important. Now, was Wolf Tone the leader of the United Irishman? He was certainly the main theorist. He was certainly the main figurehead, and I would describe him after his enforced exile in 795 as the chief military plenipotentiary of the United Irishman. But by then, the basic record and character of Irish republicanism had been defined, and he had played a critical role in doing that. And if he'd done nothing else for the rest of his uh, unfortunately uh, short life, that in itself would have made him our Washington. And had things gone slightly differently in 798, he almost certainly would have been our first president. Now, Tone made a number of attempts to deliver on the promises of military assistance that the French had offered. <coughs> uh, famously, in 1796, in December, he found himself off Bantry Bay with a French squadron shielding French transports of 14,000 veterans carrying 40,000 stand of arms and other munitions for the use of the United Irishmen. In his absence and by arrangement, the early nuclei of the United Irish societies had morphed into a mass-based, mass oath-bound paramilitary organisation of more than 300,000 members. They're in every county in Ireland. They're strong in every county of Ireland. Stronger in some than in others, but nonetheless a national organisation. This would have been the biggest single political movement in the history of Ireland. And when people are binding themselves by oath in a time of developing literacy, these things uh, carry an enormous amount of significance. In parts of County Wicklow, for instance, where the local population was predominantly Church of Ireland, uh, the, the uh, acolytes would swear on the Book of Common Prayer. Generally speaking, it would be on the Bible. But these things were appropriate 
and you have a very natural formation of those desiring freedom and equality binding together despite all the legal hazards. And believe you me, there were hazards. Uh, the arrival of the French at Bantry Bay uh, has led to this extraordinary situation where the one ship missing was the ship containing the Commander-in-Chief. That's given rise, as these things do, to conspiracy theories of British agents, you know, steering the guy off course. It was also the worst weather in living memory. They'd escaped the Royal Navy blockade, they got undetected to the coast of Ireland, and they spent the best part of a week riding out terrible storms until eventually, in some cases, they had to cut their moorings and get back to France, which they also did without being intercepted by the Royal Navy. And that proved one thing. The French were serious about their commitment to our Republic. They would come. And if they could come once like that, they could come again. Uh, Tone famously mentioned in his, in his extremely interesting and often very funny and poignant diaries, which he kept voluminously, that he could have tossed a biscuit to the shore of Ireland. You can almost sense his palpable frustration, which he's recording in real time, day by day, un until, of course, uh, he could no longer do so. And uh, when back in France, he was uh, commissioned in, into the French army, I should have said earlier, and he took those duties very seriously. He was sincerely a military officer of France uh, at a high level and treated so uh, as basically an ally in waiting. The French always regarded us as natural allies. And a token of this was that when the Irish Legion was created, it was the only foreign legion to carry the French Imperial Eagle. We were not regarded as mercenaries or basically speaking troops for hire. We were regarded as ideological allies. And this, take, this is a very important thing. The only main church property that was not confiscated by the French government in 1789 was the Irish College in Paris. And the key of which was famously kept symbolically by the French Department of Foreign Affairs on the left bank. So it could be closed if we were doing anything that they didn't like. And that remains ceremony of the situation this very day indeed. Everything else was taken. Now some it came back again. But the Irish College was not confiscated by the French state. Now I could say a lot more about Tom's writings. This isn't the time for a full based <laughs> lecture. But I would leave you with a few thoughts. Tom knew that in the event of failure or capture, there's a very high likelihood he would be tried for treason and executed. Uh, he knew that his French army commission would not necessarily shield him. Sadly, his brother Matthew Tone, who was an officer of the French army, along with his close comrade, Pathani Matiling, similarly so, had been captured in the aftermath of Humbert's expedition to the west of Ireland in August, September 1798. Their uniforms were disregarded by the British, who executed them. A little known fact is that the French government had warned the British, if you keep executing Irish men in the service of France, we're going to start executing British officers in retaliation. Now, this is not a very pleasant conversation to be having in a place such as this, but these, the stakes were very high and people knew it. In the summer of 1798, perhaps 30,000, 40,000 Irish people died in, in, a, in, a, in an invasion uh, that didn't happen, and when it did happen, it was the place too late, but nonetheless, there was reasons for that, which are complicated. But the test faced by the British government in Ireland was something that they'd never seen anywhere. They could not believe it. They had to transfer the bulk of all troops in these islands at a time of invasion scare from France to Ireland. I mean, Cornwallis' army ended up to be more than 30,000 men strong. The Irish casualties in that summer and the early autumn of 98 were equal or more than those endured during the French Revolution. Now, the French Revolution was meant to be byword for, for, you know, bloodiness and disaster and savagery. Oh, no, no, no. It was a cakewalk compared to what happened in Ireland. So you have the successful American, the successful French, and the third Atlantic Revolution in Ireland contained, but not necessarily permanently suppressed. So when the opportunity came to return with a further French probing force under Admiral Bompard, uh, Tone was there. As is well known, they had the misfortune of being uh, running once again into historically bad weather, and once again into the very capable uh, British Admiral uh, um, Warren. Uh, on the 10th of October 1798, they're off Loch Swilly. They, they were waiting for other circumstances to align before they disembarked. And of course, in, on one day later, they were peremptorily attacked by uh, the skillful commander, Admiral Warren. Tone famously refused an opportunity to escape in, in a, light, at a light ship to France, which indeed did make, make France, so it was eminently possible. It isn't pie in the sky. He fought it out on the flagship, which at one point was fighting five Royal Navy ships of the line. Uh, by the time it was eventually captured, it's, it had been demasked by fire. The, the, uh, the decks were covered in the dead and the dying. It was a bloody shambles of a thing. And Tone had directed one of the, of the batteries in that fight with great heroism. So he's a remarkable man. You're looking at a polemicist, a visionary, an intellectual, a diplomat, a leader of men, and someone of enormous stature. He knew, of course, that he would be recognized, and the fact he was recognized casually by an old acquaintance of George Hill, that's simply one of the anecdotes of history. He was going to be recognized. 
Uh, he knew he'd be court martialed, which was on the 10th of November 1798, after being committed to the provost of the Royal Barracks in Dublin. He knew he'd be sentenced to death, and he addressed this point in his sort of his short speech from the dock as an enemy officer, but certainly not hanged as some sort of traitor. Because how, of course, could an Irishman seeking democracy in his own country against foreigners be considered a traitor? It's, it's ridiculous. And of course, he was in no sense asking for clemency. He knew he was going to die. His brother in Teeling, that body's cast at a copy's acre. Perhaps his body would be, uh, would be produced for burial here in the, in the family site, perhaps not. There is a misconception that Tone took the classical option of self-harm, of fatal self-harm, to avoid the, um, the indignity of being hanged. The kernel of truth is this, and I think this is probably the case. He was aware that his old friend Oliver Bond had died in suspicious circumstances in, in, in captivity in 1798. He was aware that Lord Edward Fitzgerald had died, the citizen lord had died, uh, in, in captivity from wounds. Was that inevitable? We'll never know. Uh, he, he, he had this quip that he found himself a poor anatomist, because he did probably inflict a knife wound to his neck, but not one that was meant to be fatal. And it wasn't fatal. But with medical neglect, lack of attention, perhaps lack of medical skill, within nine days he was dead. Why was that? It was to buy time for his family to arrange a writ of habeas corpus that his, his petition to be shot could be reconsidered by the Lord Lieutenant who had the power to do that. Uh, Cornwallis, by the way, the man who lost America and didn't do that well in India either, was, was personally not a bloodthirsty savage as, as, as uh, Carhampton and Lake were, other British forces in Ireland, but nonetheless uh, Cornwallis was clear that they would do this for symbolic purposes. So Tone was going to be spared the indignity of being decollated, in other words, posthumously having his head cut off and his head uh, um, displayed. Uh, Robert Emmett, in 1803, did have his head cut off, but the head was given back to the family, but it wasn't stuck in a barracks, which was the common fate of people executed at this point in time. So we're looking here at medieval savagery. And one of the reasons they did that, by the way, is deliberate desecration of the body and the medieval church and the Christian church traditions. The desecration of the body is a problem for, for, for the end of days. I'm getting a little bit theoc the, uh, the theocracy here, but you know what I'm saying. The fact of the matter is that Tone did die. I don't think he was assassinated, but it's certainly, to my, to my mind, maybe not certainly, but the bound of probability is he did not intend to take his own life. Uh, correctly, I suppose, the British authorities allowed his family, his friends, collect the body and bury it. Um, Bolton Samuel as I said, had become the, the place, the domicile of his father, due for all sorts of reasons. But Tone lived on, of course. Tone lived on. He's one of the first United Irishmen to have a marker. And his grave marker was so, so significant here that it was chipped away completely by the 1840s by people who venerated him so much they're taking souvenirs home. Uh, we now have this enormous edifice. Tone has always been significant. And in concluding, I'll say this to you. This is a man <coughs> who could have stayed at home and inherited the wealth that was coming to him, which came in drips and drabs in due course. He could have, with his mind, have had a highly successful career at the bar. He had, he had relatives, including the Chief Justice, uh, Cole Warden, a, a cousin. Uh, he had relatives who had been visited to sponsor and patronise him within that profession to high offices through all the corruption of the time. He could have been a beneficiary of all of this. He was somebody who did not have to do any of the things he did, but he did it for the right reasons. He was driven by ideology and justice and morality. And this is a man we should revere. Um, quite correctly, quite correctly, De Tone is venerated here annually by people who have faith and, and uh, regard for the Republican ideals for which he died. He should be venerated. He should also be emulated. Thank you very much.